over the world. It shook up men, women, boys, and girls. The headlines said, if you want to be rich, then you better make sure that you got your shit. Oh, come on. Good evening. Welcome to Captions and another segment of Youth and Drug Abuse. Uh, this evening we were privileged to have with us some young folk who took out of their schedules uh, the time uh, and quite frankly to share some personal experiences with you that uh, many young folk uh, have been reluctant to come on camera and do. Uh, again, I will remind you that if your image on your screen is a little out of focus, that was because our uh, request was that we not uh, clearly identify the faces of young people and not for the reasons that are obvious as they are in processes of correcting their lives and beginning to seek out new opportunity. And we wanted to certainly respect that here on Captions. Uh, when we left the program last week, uh, we talked a little bit about how you got involved uh, and some of the things you started out doing and some of the activity that uh, the, the drug abuse uh, led you to get involved with. For the viewers who may have missed uh, that segment last week, could you kind of do a quick recap of how you got involved in some of the activity that you got involved with as a result of drug abuse? Uh, <clears throat> as I said last week, I was, I grew up on the south side of Chicago and I was uh, in a gang and uh, it was more or less peer pressure because the older members of the gang, that was the thing to do. They, they uh, stuck up drug dealers and uh, as I said, I started out drinking and smoking marijuana. And under the influence of these drugs, uh, I, cause, let me back up some. I used to tell myself I would never use heroin or cocaine, the hard drugs. But like I said, under the influence of, her, of uh, marijuana and alcohol, I found myself using. And I didn't realize until the next day that I had went against one of my principles, you know. And uh, after I did it, the fear of it was gone because uh, I noticed it didn't harm me. Well, I thought it did anyway, you know, physically or whatever. What did you fear? I feared the, the dependency, uh, the way it did people. I seen, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where drugs are a way of life. And I see the, the attic on the corner, you know, raggedy, no money, do anything for the drug. And I always used to say I didn't want to be that way, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, like I said, under the influence of marijuana and alcohol, all I know is the next day I woke up and it, and it hit me that I had tried it, you know. And uh, it wasn't nothing to it. And therefore, I put it in the class at that time with, with the drug that I was using then, alcohol and marijuana, as a drug that can be controlled, you know. Uh, that was because I had no knowledge of them, really, at mm -hmm. that time. I've heard certain things. And uh, the opportunity came to get more and more involved into it, and the more I got involved into it, the more I started seeking the drug on my own, you know. I got involved to it, I was being served, you know. Older members of the gang was giving it to me, you know, because they had excess of it from, from robberies. And as it got good to me, I started going out looking for the drug myself, you know, when it wasn't around. At, at that point, did it ever cross your mind that uh, the drug was taking control? No. At that point, the 
drug, the effect that the drug was, was giving me was an effect of comfortability. And uh, whenever I, uh, I can remember whenever I came upon a problem like a disagreement with my mother, you know, she nagging at me about school grades or whatever, or rejection from my girlfriend, or rejection from members of the gang, I would want to get comfortable, because that, that made me feel uncomfortable, you know, and I want to get back comfortable, and I would go and try to get the mail on, and with that effect, that sedated effect, you know, uh, you forget everything. Everything is in the back of your mind, and you nod, you know. So, so pretty soon, can you give me some time frame? Because one day, you were sitting there, smoking a joint, having a drink, saying, I'm not going to try them hard drugs. I see what it's doing to these brothers out here. And then before what period of time did it appear to be something that you could handle? Uh, okay, after the first, uh, the first day I used it, the hard drugs, I think it was about a good six months, you know, because I wasn't indulging myself with them every day. Mm -hmm. It was like once a week or once, you know, every other week. But each time I did it, I felt better, you know, it felt better and better to me. <clears throat> Matter of fact, the first time I did it, I, I got kind of nauseated from it, but it didn't stop me from doing it. After that, you, you grow immune to it, you, you know, you go, grow to like it. And uh, each time I did it, I felt better and better. And I say in a matter of about six months, I was doing it every day. Now every day gets to be quite expensive, right? Right. What kind of money are we talking about if you had to support a habit like that every day? Uh, the minimum of about $40 a day the minimum. But, okay, for, for instance, if that's all you can get for that day, then you, then you would have to settle for that. I mean, you can go to bed without feeling bad or whatever as far as the physical uh, uncomfortability that it, it gives you. But uh, it's been plenty of times that I've uh, came across more than $40, you know, three and $400, and wind up spending it all on the drug in that one day. But you could easily average uh, somewhere between $250 and $300 a week. Oh, at $40 a day? Yeah. Yeah. It's been times I didn't, I've actually come across a couple of thousand dollars and spent it in two or three days. So the habit was an expensive proposition for me. Pardon? I said the habit became a, an expensive, right. a costly proposition. Right. You feel any regrets about the money? Well, I mean, I I wish I wish I had the money now. You know, in the state of mind I'm in, I I see where I can put that money to better use. You know, but I can't cry with spilled milk. Do you have any harsh feelings about the drug experience? Or do you do you own you accept ownership for getting involved yourself, or you blame it on somebody else? Or how do you deal with that? No, I accept ownership. I mean, I was uh, I I chose to use the drug. I chose to smoke marijuana. I chose to drink alcohol. Did nobody put no gun in my head. You know, I think that not being able to deal with certain emotions, you know, not being equipped with the right coping skills to deal with certain emotions that uh, I, let, I, I let that play on the fact, you know, that I was uncomfortable to the fact that, I, you know, like I get rejected or whatever. Okay, I think that come from, I, I didn't have a father in my home, okay? And my mother worked two jobs and just didn't have no adult leadership. And I looked 
outside the home for adult leadership. And the people that I looked up to were the dope dealer, the pimp, the stick up men. And these were the people who were successful in my eyesight because they had a lot of money, cars, brand new cars, two, three girlfriends, jewelry, you know. These are things that are... <clears throat> Uh, they were the role model. Right, you know, that was the way, that was success, <laughs> getting out the ghetto, you know. Um, did your mother, how did your mother, did she ever find out what was happening? I hid it from her for a good while. I started using drugs at 11 years old. All right, I'm 29 now. Uh, I hid it for, for, I think, until I was about 17. And then that's when it got to the point where it, you know, I couldn't hide it no more. I was sticking up very heavily then. And uh, as a result of that, I, I've been to the penitentiary twice for armed robbery. Uh, when she did confront me with it, I told her, you know, I could not tell. It was, it was too far gone anyway, you know, at that point. But uh, she didn't know how to deal with it. She, uh, helped me get on a methadone program, which really just elevated my usage, really, to a certain extent. I'm, I'm unfamiliar, explain that. Methadone, methadone is a drug that they use to substitute heroin with, the heroin usage with, because it's uh, uh, a chemically dependent drug also, but it's made in the laboratories and therefore it's a cleaner drug and it can be, you can detox from it. That's why they use it. You can't detox off of heroin because don't nobody know the everyday dosage of heroin, okay? Methadone can be uh, detoxed from, from milligram to milligram, you know? And you can come off of a drug addiction with no pain, no physical pain, you know, the withdrawal symptoms. Sure. But it's also, uh, it's also a, a harder drug, you know, I mean, it's, the, if, okay, you can drink methadone and I think it lasts in the system something like 36 hours, you know, from a certain amount of milligrams. Uh, it takes... It takes three weeks to catch a habit off methadone. It also takes about three weeks to, to kick one, you know. Whereas if you kick a, a heroin habit, cold turkey, you'd be through with it within a week, more or less. So if I hear you right, what you're saying is while methadone is a legal drug, it has similar uh, withdrawal effects, only they're more intense. More intense. Okay. I noticed uh, the young lady sitting next to you, you seemed like you could identify with some of what mm -hmm. he was sharing. I'm on the methadone program right now. I started a detox a week ago. Okay, for folks in our viewing audience who may not be familiar with that term, what does detox mean to you? Withdrawing from the methadone. Uh, it's methadone maintenance. They can, the nurse, doctor, or your treatment center can maintain you um, while you're supplying your body or your physical need for the drug uh, the treatment the counseling the groups is there to take care of this your head your psychological part um, you find out or I have anyway that drugs were part of my problem but my prob my real problem were the problems I had before I started doing the drugs and it's hard uh, nine years later or eight years later to go back and capture those same feelings that you had years ago and you have to deal with those things. We'd like to get into when we come back just what led you to uh, methadone treatment and how you got involved with drugs but uh, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with more on captions right after this. All right. Welcome back to captions. And if you're just joining us, we are discussing the whole question of youth and, and drugs. And in our studio audience, uh, we're going to go right into uh, where we left off. Uh, and we left off talking about 
uh, the impact that, that drugs can have and how you, I think you indicated you started out at 11 years old and you were able to hide that from your parents for six years. And, you know, we downplay the importance of role models, but I'd like for you to touch on that again. Because I remember as a young man uh, living in the projects, you know, you love your mother and you respect her, but as you start getting into the teens and start thinking of yourself as a man, you start wanting somebody to identify with, look up to somebody that you might even want to be like when you grow up. And I too, like yourself, my father wasn't there. So you just had to pick out somebody, it happened to be for me, a coach at a high school. Uh, in your case, it was somebody else. Right. Tell us a little bit about that again. Um, like you were saying, <clears throat> uh, you need someone to look up to, you know, because I think it's everybody's dream to be successful. And uh, at the time that I was growing up and in the teens, the people who looked successful to me were the dope dealers, <clears throat> the pimps, uh, the stick-up men, the ones who came about money very easily and very quick. Uh, they had cars and, the, and jewelry and nice clothes, you know, and, and really just did about whatever they wanted to do, you know. And uh, I looked up to that. I wanted, I wanted that, you know. That was my idea of success at the time. So, uh, therefore, I patted myself in the same, you know, footsteps that they went through. You never saw the downside. No, you never see, you only see the limelight. That's the, that's the sad part. You only see the limelight. You don't see the bad part of it, the jail or the drug addiction or the killings, you know, you don't see none of that. What about what they were doing to everybody in the community that they were touching with the drugs? Well, like I said, the way I looked at that was it was of my own choice. Even though I wasn't aware of the peer pressure, you know, the acceptance part of it, at that, at that age, you're not aware of them things. Uh, but they did happen. They do, they do happen. Um, okay, excuse me. Because when we broke, and I, I didn't want to lose this point, um, you were talking about how you had gotten uh, involved in what was happening to you, but we didn't get a chance to talk about what led up to your treatment situation that you're in now at Stonehenge. What, what's the history of your drug involvement that led you to seek treatment, and how did you wind up at Stonehenge? I um, started realizing that I could not say no to the drug. I think you retain that up until the end. You always think you can quit. And then when it finally dawns on you or you finally accept the fact that you can't control it anymore, um, the things that you've done to get it, um, I got to the point to where I couldn't stand to look at myself anymore. I hated everything about me, the way I looked. I had let myself go. I was under 100 pounds. I looked like walking death. Um, I had nothing, I was an empty shell. There was nothing inside of me except the desire to use the drug. Um, I don't know if it was God or who that made me see or realize I needed help. I couldn't continue to exist in that way. And that's all it was. It was not life. It wasn't living. It was existence. And it was a sad existence at that. Um, I made the first step, which was hard, and that was admitting that I had a problem, that I had no more control over my life, which was hard um, because you, like, you still like to hide. You like the feeling of not worrying about anything, not having any kind of weight or, or stress on you. Um, I admitted that I had a problem. I went to an outpatient treatment center um, and started on the methadone program. 
what I didn't realize when I was doing this, I thought that I could walk into the clinic doors, see a doctor, uh, start on methadone, and I would be fine. That was all I had to do, was walk in the door. I didn't realize everything that went along with it. And it's, it's just like um, a person that goes on a diet that has been large all of their life. You have to go back and learn to eat all over again. It's the same thing with treatment. You have to go back to the beginning and start all over again. You're, you're only as old as the first day you started using. That's where your mental and emotional has stopped. I want to ask all of you this question, because all four of you are, are there in treatment at Stonehenge, which is a, uh, I guess you may call it a therapeutic drug treatment community here in Peoria. And, and the young lady on the end from the west side of Chicago, he said you're an 18-year-old person who's one of the youngest persons there, so I'm going to start with, with youth first today. But she says you have to go back to the beginning. How do the staff at Stonehenge help you do that? Um, they make you aware of things. They got uh, these things called learning experiences. Like um, if you have a funky behavior, like you're, you're using profanity, um, you're reacting off your gut, you're disrespecting. They have this thing called learning experience and it can lead to writing a 500 word essay, um, GI in the drop room or uh, Cutting the weeds, um, or losing all your privileges, sitting on a prospect chair. And, you know, we have a thing where we have to sign up at night when we want to go to bed. Um, we have to sign in and out when we want to leave the unit. And you have to be there two weeks to get privileges, phony privileges. And they have each phase that you go through, like, go out of the unit. It, it's to make you aware of everything you do because sometimes, most of the times, when you recover, it's the little things that may cause a relapse. Um, it's your whole behavior that causes you to continue. Yeah, to continue. Um, that's why you have to start back from the beginning. You don't only have to work on the problems that caused you to use drugs in the first place, but you have to grow. And in growing, you have to be aware of anything and everything you do. Um, our day starts out, our first wake-up call is at 6. We get up at 6.30 or 6. Um, you have to be on the floor downstairs by 7.30. Every morning, you have to dust, sweep your floor, and make your beds. Um, you go downstairs. We have a morning meeting every morning. The day, therapeutic day lasts until 3 o'clock. We're involved in everything in the house, from cleaning to everything. It's our responsibility. We live there. A lot of us tend to forget responsibility. Right. We like to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and that's it. You, you, you look out for number one, that's, that's a dope fiend attitude, you know. No concern. Right. <laughs> you don't care about nothing but yourself, you know, mm -hmm. about the same thing you do on the street. You don't care about nobody. You don't love your. You don't love nobody else because you don't love yourself. You know, and what the program do is it teaches <clears throat> awareness uh, through discipline. You know, uh, by having certain functions you have to do around the house. It teaches responsibility because uh, we are irresponsible. You know, we don't. We we duck responsibility, uh, and it teaches how to get back in touch with feelings because as drug users we uh we forgot how to feel mm -hmm. you know we use drugs to keep from feeling you know rejection depression whatever any kind of anxiety stress we use drugs whenever we encounter these uh, these feelings so we learn how to care for one another through a tool we call a pull up we pull each other we like if i see her uh walking around with her shoes untied. I tell her, she, you know, tie her shoes up. And she had to respond with, you know, thank you, politely. And really it's just teaching <coughs> the main basic manners that you learn from a child, okay? Excuse me. Like the sister said that uh, 
when you start using drugs, you, you stop growing emotionally at that point. And we have to learn how to grow again, you know, after we stop using drugs. Our treatment comes from the other residents. Um, staff members are there to guide you through some of it. But our treatment comes from our brothers and sisters in the house. Um, a lot of times they can point out behaviors that we don't see, um, help us with those things. Um, it's called feedback. If they point out a behavior, uh, you get feedback, and that helps you see things that you're not seeing yourself. Two life experiences of, of the other family members might help in something that you're going through. Um, it's really to open up all of your feelings again, love, concern, all of that. You have to deal with hatred. You have to deal with the negative feelings as well as the good feelings that, you, that you're just starting to experience again and how to control them. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm having some feelings uh, because I'm thinking about here's some young folk who are residents in Stonehenge who uh, if, if you share your background there's folks out there on the other side of those cameras who'd be scared to death of you. I'm just telling you the way it is. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but that's the reality. When you go to talking about drug addicts, dope fiends who stuck up, stole, robbed it, whatever, to a drug, and everybody gets uptight. And here I'm sitting here, we're having a conversation, uh, and I just feel like here's some people um, who are getting themselves together to get ready for another opportunity that's, in life. That's most, most people or the general public are ignorant to drugs. When you say drugs, automatically they get a picture in their mind of illegal activities. Um, alcoholism is accepted. It's illegal. You don't necessarily have to do illegal things to come into it. With drugs, it's the complete opposite. And that's the way people take it. That's the only difference. The mm -hmm. only difference in drug abuse and alcohol abuse is one is legal and one isn't. Right. No there difference. are people that drink, that steal, that lie, that's that right. cheat, that stick people up. They do the exact same things, but the majority of the public don't look at it as that way. They Drugs think, carry a, a dirty attitude. They think, um, well, if you're, you're not shooting no dope in your arm, we don't have no problem. Right. Take a pill. At Take least you're not, you're not, you don't yeah. have a problem, you're not robbing nobody. There's yeah. everyday people up. out there, successful people that's on drugs, prescribed drugs, right. volumes, you know, uh, Demerol, drugs that the doctors prescribe to them for pain and they're abusing them, you know, and not aware. The scary part about drug abuse is, is that it takes you out of, out of context of yourself. It, it, it makes you uh, dependent on a whole new image, you know. You, you feel comfortable after you take the drug, so therefore you take the drug to go to a party, you take the drug to, to get up, you take the drug to wash up, you take the drug to eat, you know, and it, it, it gets out of, it makes you get out of touch with yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why people don't know that it's a problem, you know, they're not dealing with nothing really, the drug is, is pro prohibiting them from dealing with themselves, and they don't know this. I want to, something I meant to ask you earlier, because I know that, say, my mother, if I was using drugs, I'd have she would have a slightest idea what was happening. What could you say to mothers out there who are stuck with that awesome responsibility of um, attempting, I mean, you think about it, you said that you had a mother that was working two jobs just trying to take care of the rent the light bill and the food on the plate and at the same time give that motherhood that, that, that mothers need and that a lot of times there just hasn't time to do that. What I'd like for you to do is, is, is give some thought, all of you, to what mothers and fathers for that matter can do to be a better parent and help children deal with that question of who are being tempted or who are involved and don't really want to go. You know, maybe if at 12 you start talking to mom about it, there, there may have been a different avenue later. I would like for you to think about those things and we're gonna come back and discuss 
your feelings about what parents can do to be a better parent and also to recognize things that are happening in the home. We're going to be break, we're going to take a break as a matter of fact and we'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to Captions. For you parents, I'd like for you for the next 30 minutes to pull up a chair and pay very close attention. You may hear something this evening that can help save a life of a loved one of yours. And for you young people whose parents are not at the TV, you may want to call them and invite them to come sit and share with us for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, when we left, we, we promised we'd come back and talk about some feelings and some things that was happening, say, between you and your parents that maybe could have changed the direction that you went. Do you recall any specific instances or things that happened around the house that you think you and your parents could have handled differently? Yes. Uh, <coughs> I can recall, okay, I got three brothers and a sister, and uh, I can recall, I can recall uh, quite a few instances where I would blame for things that my brothers did or my sister did, and I would get, you know, punished for it. I would get whipped or whatever. And uh, I can remember the frustration that, I, that would build up in me because when I tried to talk to my mother, you know, she would make me shut up and whoop me or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> I would, I would leave the house feeling, you know, resentment and uh, wanting revenge. And I can't take revenge out on my parents, you know, that wouldn't be right. Can't do it no way. So therefore, I would do something uh, radical or rebellious against their, their rules. You know, like my mother tell me not to use drugs or not to smoke or whatever, you know, and, and that would be the time I would go out and smoke a cigarette or drink some wine or smoke a joint, you know, calling myself getting revenge, getting back at her. But really I was hurting myself, but I wasn't, I wasn't able to comprehend that at that time. What could have, what, so really the quality that was missing there, while she was in the process of disciplining, you all needed to talk. Talk, right. Lack of communication. Uh, I think that mothers need to try to understand the kids more and really I don't be, I'm a firm believer that uh, physical discipline don't accomplish too much. If anything, it might make the, the child regress more, you know, to a, another state. You saying, yeah, yeah. You, okay, let's be specific now. You're saying that strap on a young brother don't, don't and, didn't change your attitude for you. Didn't change your attitude that much. Right, right. I noticed you shaking your head. You you agree with me? It's it's easy for us to handle those kinds of punishment, but it's hard for us to take a good look at ourselves. That's a lot more effort. That's a lot more work. Right. You know, I can recall one time I I did some. I, you know, I think I really did. And my mother used to give me a choice all the time. She used to ask me, "Well, what do you want to do?" stay in the house for punishment or whooping. And I would take the whooping so I can go outside. You know, so that wasn't, that wasn't no discipline. You know, it was something that I can deal with and it'd be over with. Uh, I also remember times she would sit down, the very few times she did, and would talk to me and really make me feel ashamed of what I did. Mm -hmm. And I would break down and cry, and them things I never did again, you know. So I think communication, more or less, is was needed more in the household, you know, to sit down, try to understand the children, spend time with them uh, on the days off, take them out to positive atmospheres, you know, show them the real role models in the community, you know, don't let them look up to the pimps or the pushers, show them the lawyers and the doctors, you know, show them the real success of life. If you're a working mother, usually on your day off you spend time cleaning, uh, laundry, shopping, Assign those duties to the kids. Let them start learning responsibility. On your day off, spend time with them. Talk about real things, feelings. When, as an adolescent, we all feel that we're unique in our feelings. No one's ever felt this way before. No one's ever went through this before. And it's not true. Um, again, for you and our viewing audience, um, don't bother to focus on your TV screen because we have it out of focus here in the studio at the request of our guests. And I think if you've been following the program, it's easy to understand 
um, why our, our guests may have chosen that option, and it's one we give them when we're discussing sensitive information. But, but I do think what you raise in terms of beginning, spend time, communication, assign responsibility, are some uh, parenting techniques that, that might be helpful to children no matter what the circumstance are. You've been over, awfully quiet over there. What, what would you say to parents who uh, wanted to do what they could to help their children be a success? Well, first of all, you know, when I was young, I had a lot of pressure on me. And um, it was hard for me to really just come to my mother and um, talk to her about my pressure. But I advise, you know, at least once a week, ask the children, how do you feel? And uh, is there anything you would like to talk to me about? Because it's not just right for a child to sit around and deal with pressure on his own because he's too young and it's hard for him to just sit there and not say anything. I think the mother should just come to him and ask him, do you have anything you would like to talk about? Let me tell you a secret. I would, I would venture to say that today's parent who has the pressures of paying the bills, and raising the kids and not enough money and all of the things that's happening in the country, they don't believe you got any pressures. <laughs> See, too, it's just like when, when you're a, a small child um, and your mother tells you not to do something and you go ahead and do it anyway, uh, uh, often it's said that, that you are just seeking attention. As you grow older, Sometimes you, you do the negative things for the exact same reason, and a lot of people or parents don't understand that. They look at it as you're a bad child instead of a signal or sign that this child needs help. One of, I haven't heard anybody mention the word love. Do, huh? Let me hear from you. When I was growing up, there was like no, no communication at all. I mean, my oldest brother's 13 years older than me, and I got a brother 23. Uh, my mom, she wasn't the type that was like a motherly type. She never gave me love and affection. She never reached out and asked me, do you have any problems? Um, we never had mother-daughter talks. And I think that's real important, especially for a girl growing up. They look up to their mother as the role model. And I've missed that, and I, in years and years, I was searching for that, a motherly type. And you, that's the biggest part of a relationship, the love and affection. You know, being a parent myself with one kid in college and a nine-year-old daughter, you know, what I'm hearing is, is probably the single most important ingredient is spend time with your kids. That's right. Yep. Take them places, uh, do things together. The square stuff. The square mm -hmm. stuff. The birds and the bees. <laughs> Talk about the birds and the yeah. bees. Things that parents don't do no more. If, if you learn your child or you know your child, you'll be able to see when those changes occur. Give them responsibilities, you know, like clean up your room. and You know, because I used to, my parents, <clears throat> my mother, used to pick up behind me, you know, uh, make up my bed for me and just little things like that. And uh, I got into a, a trend of not doing nothing but jumping up, brushing my teeth, washing my face and eating, run outside, you know. And uh, when it got to a point where she didn't have the time to do that no more and she would try to tell me to do it on my own, it was hard to get me to do it, you know. And then I would get whippings and whatever. And uh, it didn't help much, you know. I I do it one day, and the next day I neglect doing it, you know. And uh, you saying start them out on the right foot. Start them out with responsibilities, cause uh, you know, as a youngster, I uh, didn't have too many responsibilities. So when I did uh, start coming upon responsibilities as a as an adult, I really didn't want to deal with, it, you know. Just like at the house, if you can't respect responsibility at work or to another person. You can't respect responsibility to yourself. Um, in our groups, we have a static group, which if you have any problems inside the house, if you don't understand something or you can't accept the way something is, 
or outside of the house if you're having problems with your, your family or your mother, your father, your mate. You can talk about it in these groups. We get to know each other, all the residents that live in the house, and if you really get to know someone, you can see when they're, they're acting different, if something's bothering them. It comes out in their behavior. Um, we have encounter groups. If you have feelings, good or bad, with another resident in the house, you can bring those feelings out and talk about them. Parents don't do that with children at home. Um, we sit in chairs facing each other in front of the whole family and however the feelings come out, they come out. There's no physical violence, no hitting, no nothing like that. It's, like it's all verbal. But parents don't do that. I noticed one thing in, in my exposure to, to folk who have been in treatment or involved in, in drug addiction, there seems to be a sense of family, if, if not even the word love, but there seems to be empathy there who, where there's an understanding, you know, they use the word about, I never understood they were talking about each other being sick, mm -hmm. okay, and naturally if you've been there and I haven't, you might have a greater appreciation for what that means and you may be more sympathetic about helping or reaching out to that person when they're going through some things. Okay. How can uh, we who are not sympathetic, uh, is there a way, I guess the word I'm searching for is education. I just don't think the average parent, if they have not been involved in drugs, have an appreciation for what's going on at all. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you advise them to do in terms of getting uh, a knowledge and an understanding of, of the problem? Go to uh, NA meetings, uh, find a sponsor, um, have the kids attend some kind of boys club, because the boys club does talk about drugs. They have people come out and talk about drugs. You know, some kind of support group where they can learn about it and acknowledge the situation. So you would, you would say that it is an important enough subject matter that they, through their own initiatives, mm -hmm. search out and get educated on the subject? Right. Either that or a group of parents get together. But, but you know, think about the, the parent that's sitting out there now with the 9, 10, 11, 12 year old kid. And they know that that's not happening in their family. They know that their kid would never do that. They're positive that's something they don't even have to worry about. What would you say to them? Okay, I, uh, I can see a parent thinking like that because my mother thought like that. My mother didn't use drugs, didn't use profanity. The house, the, the home surroundings were very pleasant, you know, but right outside that door, the environment was a jungle, you know, and if the parent, uh, see the raising of the, of the child is just not the parent's, you know, it's just, it's not the parent's responsibility alone. I mean, the child's going to have to venture out the house, and when they do, that's when they encounter, well, that's when I encountered uh, all this negativity, you know, like I was saying, the role models. Uh, if they don't have the proper role models to look up to, the father, it, it all depends on what the father's doing, then uh, the parents going to have to be aware of that and seek proper role models for their kids. Like, take them to church, you know, uh, just ball games, things like that, you know, and then constantly talk to them about the right way, you know, because, and also, I, I think they should point out, because uh, you can, if you notice your kids and watch your kids, you can tell when they're imitating or they're trying to get cool or whatever. And they, when they're doing that, most, more or less, they're imitating somebody negative in that environment. And at that point, you can try to sit down and tell them the bad part of that, you know, not just the limelight. Tell them about the jail, the murders, and whatnot, you know. Death, period. What? I want to kind of shift gears here again, and I want to talk about your futures. Obviously, you become concerned about your future, you wouldn't be intrigued. What do you see, and that's a question to all of you, 
What do you see your future holding? What What do you want to do now? What's on your mind? Uh, first of all, I want to further my education. You know, uh, I don't just want to come out of treatment and just get a job because uh, I want to have a job that I'm comfortable with. Okay, and uh. So therefore, I want to further my education. I have experience in and out of schools in in a uh, uh, electronic field. Uh, right now, I got a treatment plan that my counselors, you know, made up for me to get me back into school and to get me skills in electronics, you know, and and the proper diplomas or whatever. Therefore, I can get up into a job that I'm comfortable with and that I like doing, and that will reinforce me, you know, and make me feel good about myself completing something that I want to do. What about you? It's, it's kind of strange. I'm 23 years old and I'm just now starting to know myself. And that's a good feeling. I want to take one day at a time. I want to remain drug-free, sober, however you want to put it. I want to enjoy my life. I want to have a happy life. Some of that would be to, to go back to school, um, further my education, get a job that I enjoy, and enjoy life in a clean way. Well, with me, <clears throat> I would like to um, complete my treatment, of course, and live a drug-free life and try to look at things with a level head instead of being high. And as far as my education, I would like to complete that and go to college and try to spread some of this knowledge about my drugs and my feelings and my habit to other people so they can learn from it. But otherwise, that's about it. Um, well, I want my future to be, is I want it to be, I want to be drug free. Um, I'm going to continue going to school. Um, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to major in substance abuse. And we were saying you have to give it away to keep it. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's a very important part of recovery. Right. Give away the knowledge of <coughs> staying clean, you know. Give away... Keeps the, it up front in your, your right. mind. What it does, when you give it away, like we're doing now, right, giving it away to keep it, we're we talking about drug ab abuse and the dangers, the dangers of it. And when we do that, what it does is keep it up in front of our mind. And it really reminds me of all the, the hectic things I've been through. And uh, what it does is it reinforces me more to want to stay clean. So that's what the concept, to give it away to keep it. You know, I've specifically asked on this show, asked you to talk to the would-be user, the user, the parents and loved ones. And one person I would not want to neglect asking you to talk to this evening is the would-be employer. What can you say to folk out there who run a business, who have their dollars, their future at risk, uh, and who are controlling jobs because it seems to me a successful treatment modality must in some way incorporate it in it, in it um, an education and an opportunity because without an opportunity to, to deal with self-worth it seems to me that the treatment success gets slimmer and slimmer. What would you say to prospective employers uh, who would never consider hiring uh, a former addict. Not to go by their past track record, first of all. Right. That should be something that is up front between employee, employer, that you have that in your background. But everybody deserves a chance. Um, it doesn't feel very good to be condemned of something that, that you no longer are doing or that you haven't done to this person in particular. Um, there are different things that, that you can do at your employer's, uh, employer's request or, or you can even put up front. You can give them drops every week, every, two, three times a week if that's what's necessary to prove to them that, that you have changed. You probably have to explain that to our viewers. Yeah, drops are, are urine tests. They check for 
drugs, alcohol. So if, if an employer or prospective employer wanted to, for example, with the Stonehenge facility make arrangements where, um, as you put it, drops or urine tests can be taken periodically to determine your continued commitment to, to be drug free and they could get access to those records to determine that. Yeah. And that would have to be set up through your counselor. Uh -huh. Is that something that uh, you think an, uh, a former addict or uh, whatever the appropriate term is would, would be willing to do, who'd be interested in going into employment? They shouldn't mind if they're if clean. If serious about staying mm. clean, I don't see where it, would, where it would hinder them any, you know, where it would bother them. Matter of fact, it would help, you know, because if they're serious about staying clean, then there wouldn't be no risk involved. Mm -hmm. The yeah. hardest part for an addict is not to have so much time on their hands with nothing to do. You know, you have to have something to do. Okay. And that's where the NA meetings come in. How do you get the employer to understand that, you know, what we hear, I have to hire people here, for example. And I have on occasion hired Stone, Stonehenge uh, persons in treatment. But what we hear is once an addict, always an addict. What does that mean? That simply means that <clears throat> you have to be constantly aware that you're weak to drugs. So therefore, you can't never use them. And you got to always be on top of the things that you will come in, in touch with that might make you re relapse, you know. So therefore, you never quit working on your problem. It's a, it's a everlasting problem. Is it seeming is it like what they talk about with alcoholics? Addiction are, is a disease, yeah. just like cancer. When you are in recovery, it's in remission. Um, at any time you get weak, physically or mentally, emotionally, the cancer can start up again. And it is a killing disease if you let it take control. Another thing, you're never really totally recovered. And they teach you to be mind strong. And um, there's an aftercare. You should go to n a meetings, you know, so you can keep up your confidence. Because if you don't, you might fall back into a relapse. And they teach you that at Stonehenge to um, go for aftercare. And stay away from negative people. Stay away from the neg negative environments. Be around positive. It's, it's important your NA and AA meetings because a lot of times it is easier to relate to someone that understands and that has been where you're at. Not to say that it's not possible to talk to someone who hasn't, but they can give you the support advice, and just to know that somebody else cares. Okay. Let me ask the hard question. Can you quit using drugs? Yes. yes. If you want to. Yeah. If you want to. Because I think that's, you know, if the simple bottom line is the guy out there says, can you stop? Yeah, you can stop. Mm -hmm. You've got to really, really be tired yep. of using, of going through changes of just existing and not being productive. You know, you got to want to be some. Everybody's bottom is different. Mine's different than his, than hers, than his. And everybody has to reach that level. From then you can build your way back up. If, if you want something bad enough, you can get it. If you want a car bad enough, you'll get a job and you'll save your money to get it. It's the same thing with recovery. You have to want it. You can't make a person quit. You can't make them recover. If, if you were or had occasion, um, because I'm sure in our, in our audience this evening, if somebody out there that want to quit, they really would, would like to stop there. As the brother here puts it, they're tired of going through them changes but they don't really know exactly how to go about doing that. What, what is their first step? Mm -hmm. they, they're not anxious, obviously, to go to the police station. Uh, okay. What do they do? Then they have a problem. The way I look at it, okay, because I, you know, 
through the time I've been in treatment and talking with my brothers and sisters in treatment, I've noticed two kind of people, you know, it's the kind that are tired of going through changes to get the drugs, like stealing and whatnot, and then it's the kind that's tired of, of the changes that the drugs put them through, you know, like low self-worth, you know, uh, low morals or whatever, you know, and just the, the constant turmoil, just don't like themselves. And I use, I know that the ones that usually are tired of, of, of going through the turmoil within themselves are the ones that really want to stop because uh, a person who just tired of going through the changes that the world, that they go through to get the drug, once they stop for a while and, and get a few months so, you know, sobriety under their belt and gain weight back and get some kind of source of income coming back, then usually them the ones who, you know, they feel like they got some money to spend again and they go back out and use. But you really got to get tired with them. Mm -hmm. It's hard. The first step is hard. It really is. Um, you can college. you can pray and ask for help. So really, I think if I hear you right, the key word is you got to get tired of not liking who you've become. Right. Mm -hmm. And you got to want to become somebody that you can love again. Right. right. You got to want that self-respect. Yep. Okay. You have to love yourself first. Well, what I'd like to say as we close this, this segment, I have certainly learned a lot sharing with you. And we at the Community Action Family here certainly wish all of you the best of luck on your roads to recovery and appreciate you coming on our show and sharing with our viewers. You and our viewing audience uh, who may have grown tired of looking at that TV out of focus, uh, you, we have returned you to focus. Um, but certainly what we hope we've done this evening is helped increase your focus on the whole question of drug abuse, how it might impact your family, your friends, your loved ones. And last but not least, giving you a few tips on what may be steps you can take to assist your young people and your loved ones in avoiding a tragic trap that I think last week was referred to as a sucker's game that has been impacting and hurting and in some parts of our nation becoming an epidemic, and that is chemical substance abuse. Uh, we hope that in the weeks to come, uh, we can begin to take a, a look at how uh, medical uh, experts uh, are suggesting some, some new and innovative ways to address this question. But more importantly, we think that what we've heard tonight says that the solution's got to be in you. And we've got to begin to love again, and we've got to begin to care again. With that, I've got to go. This has been Mike Banks and Captions. Good evening. Thank you.